Hello and welcome to the Endpoint Protected demo presented by ESET Africa. Um, before we begin, I'd just basically like to illustrate a couple of things that Endpoint Protector is capable of. Um, and that's actually very nicely highlighted by the icons and the graphics that you see on the login screen over here. Um, basically, what we're going to do is I'm going to take you through the dashboard um, in order to illustrate uh, how you would do some types of configuration. Uh, but more importantly, I just want to show what you can actually achieve in terms of data loss prevention uh, with this product. Obviously, as you can see, there's a couple of things. Uh, first of all, uh, the main component uh, would be content aware protection, but we're going to start with device control. Uh, device control is effectively a way of controlling the connections of physical devices that you can connect to a machine. Uh, so that's everything ranging from webcams and USB drives, external drives, um, cell phones, and obviously anything else that you can connect to a machine, even keyboards. Um, the second component is a new addition to Endpoint Protector um, at the time of this video, and that's the enforced encryption through Easy Lock, which is applicable to USB devices specifically. Uh, so you can basically ensure that any devices that you've authorized through your organization um, is actually encrypted. So you can obviously ensure that the data sitting on those devices uh, is safe, even if the device gets stolen. Uh, the next component, which is what we're going to focus on most, is content-aware protection. And that's basically the inspection of the actual contents of files. Everything ranging from Word documents to spreadsheets to emails. And you can basically control the flow of information uh, using that module. So uh, I'm going to highlight uh, what you can effectively do there. And then the last component is mobile device management. Because obviously, with the advent of uh, data loss prevention, the mobile device aspect of it is obviously a, a logical addition because everyone nowadays is traveling around with their corporate email on their phones, um, in addition to maybe some other types of documents that are either loaded on the phones or synchronized using other tools. Um, and the mobile device management addition obviously ensures that you can uh, add security policies to those devices, first of all, because that's most important. Unfortunately, most people still sit with some type of swipe to unlock, for example. Um, and then there's obviously the other MDM facilities such as tracking and locating and enforcing encryption as well um, and doing remote wipes or locks. So let's begin. I'm just going to log into our instance here. So the main screen that we're ending up on at the moment is the dashboard, obviously. Um, and this obviously gives you a great overview of a couple of things that have happened across the environment. Um, it gives you an overview of the endpoints and devices that you've got enrolled. Obviously, this is just my demo environment, so it is a, a small subset of machines. It also shows the users that are most active or the number of transfers that have been blocked. Uh, the overall status of mobile devices, whether or not passcodes are enforced. That's obviously one of the main ways in improving mobile device security in your organization. Uh, it gives you a quick update um, around the license expiration dates and whether or not certain modules are active. And then, of course, all of these tabs at the bottom show you a variety of logs at a glance um, so that you can quickly see what's maybe happening in your environment. So I'm not going to go into every single one of these options. Basically, there's a few things that I'd like to highlight. Um, one of them is whenever there are updates released from Endpoint Protector, whether those are security updates or new features, you can obviously synchronize your instance to update automatically. So mine, uh, as you can see, uh, checked fairly recently. Um, and obviously, this will then ensure that if there are updates available, I would be able to apply them from here. Um, alternatively, if this instance for some reason does not have internet connectivity, you could also uh, actually upload a patch or an update manually to the instance in order to apply that. Um, next, in terms of endpoint management, I obviously just have a handful of machines on my environment. One of them is actually offline at the moment. That machine is currently powered off. Um, and effectively, you can see that there's two machines here enrolled, and this is the status that you'd expect to see. Uh, you'd obviously see IP addresses, whether or not it's in a specific department. Uh, it's obviously linked to my domain. You can see the MAC address for the network interfaces, the version of the endpoint protector agent sitting on those machines, 
whether or not that endpoint is licensed and then if any manual modifications have been made through say the edit button over here then you'd be able to uh, see timestamps uh, as to when it was modified and who it was modified by um, obviously I've allocated all of these to a basic group just for illustrative purposes and there's obviously a couple of things that you can do from here but I'm going to focus on uh, some of the global settings because they effectively count, uh, count um, counted uh, within each of these sections manually um, in terms of rights and these rights basically apply to the device control um, you'll basically be able to see what types of devices I can actually control from endpoint protector so these are the global rights and it's important to note that uh, on the left hand side here you'll see there's an order of device rights user rights computer rights group rights and global rights and these are actually the order in which they are processed um, there's one setting which I'll show in a moment where you can basically prioritize either user or computer rights but this is basically the order that you'd expect if you're prioritizing, prioritizing user rights um, it will always uh, override group rights for example and group rights override global rights so you can basically configure this in one of two ways you can either configure your global rights to be incredibly restrictive and only allow things on say a group or a computer or a user level where necessary or depending on your organization's needs or the management you can do the reverse of that and make it very lax or less restrictive on the global rights and then start uh, locking things down on a group computer or user level so it's nice in the sense that you can basically set it up uh, whichever way would be easiest or most applicable to your organization so you can see here that I'm blocking uh, most things by default. Um, I'm only allowing things like optical drives. That's because my demo environment happens to be virtual machines. And if I want to do things like uh, installing the hypervisor tools, for example, that's obviously mounted as an optical drive. Um, then I'm allowing Wi-Fi. I'm allowing Bluetooth. Um, I'm allowing keyboards. Um, I'm allowing access to network shares, but most other things are effectively blocked. So obviously you can see here that you can lock down and control pretty much everything, including uh, cell phones, webcams, uh, iPods and iPads, uh, SATA controllers for obviously disks, um, and a variety of other external uh, connectivity. Um, so if I wanted to override these, I can basically go to group rights, for example. I'm just going to go to the edit section of my little uh, test group here and now you can see that I can either preserve the global settings whether or not those are highly restrictive or uh, less restrictive uh, or I can um, allow or deny that and effectively override the global setting and the same would apply for computer and user permissions. Uh, next, in terms of global settings on endpoints, I'm again going to focus on global um, because group and computer here can again override the global settings. So the entire interface, as you can see, is obviously very nicely laid out because you can always uh, see the order of rights and you don't have to worry about trying to figure that out. Um, in terms of global settings here, some of these are incredibly important and these will effectively influence whether or not certain functions are working in the system such as file tracing or the content aware protection file shadowing uh, what this does is um, if the content aware protection policies are flagged which we'll cover in a moment um, then it actually takes a copy of the file in question um, in order for you to review that at a later stage for example um, but more importantly are the settings down here so especially if you've just implemented endpoint protector it's obviously important to get as much visibility over your environment as possible so you can basically reduce the log interval um, the default here is usually about 30 minutes and I've obviously reduced it to as low as one minute so that no matter what happens if I'm working on my demo environment that those logs are effectively synchronized to my dashboard as quickly as possible so this is obviously just for initial deployment it's obviously greater uh, or better if you uh, reduce this threshold uh, either on global group or computer level once you are satisfied with the information that's being sent to your server then there's a couple of things that you can set such as the local log size that's the local log that's kept on each endpoint uh, things like the shadow size and the minimum and maximum file sizes for file shadowing so um, this is effectively a setting that will say uh, in this case files need to be either 
uh, zero up to four megabytes in order for them to be copied to the instance for later review. So anything larger than four megabytes at this point will not be copied. Uh, and then there's obviously a couple of other settings that you can set here as well. Uh, you can also customize the notifications that people will receive uh, in the event that something is blocked, for example. So I can basically select any one of these devices and I'd be able to uh, customize uh, what type of um, alert or notification that user would receive in the event that that device is blocked, for example. The default in, in the case of something like an optical drive is just a, a rudimentary or basic operating system access denied error. In terms of the content aware protection, and that's obviously the main focus of your DLP solution, um, again, if I'm going to the dashboard here, it's a fairly empty instance again because it's just a demo environment rather than a production. Uh, but more importantly, let's go to the content aware policy so that I can actually show you what the system is capable of. So I've got two policies in place here. I'm just going to focus on my content list. And this, as you can see, is a, is a Windows policy. Um, and the reason that they differentiate between operating systems here is because obviously each operating system has different sets of software. Um, and they need to effectively allow you to select the software. And it would be difficult to differentiate between, um, say, Mac OS X and Windows software in one section like this. So you basically create policies depending on the operating system in question. Um, this policy is set to block and report. So basically, if any of my uh, parameters are identified, it'll actually block that transfer and then obviously report it to the system as opposed to just uh, logging it. I can also hide the notification specifically for the content aware protection policy. So that'll be then be transparent to the user. Uh, the downside of that is obviously if they're trying to say copy something to a flash drive and that's simply not working, they won't know why. Um, so they'll basically just uh, not be able to copy it and that'll be completely transparent to the user. There's also a threshold value. So what this means is it uh, basically determines that in the case of this policy, uh, if one variable is flagged, it will immediately be blocked and reported. But let's say I can make this three or five. And then basically, if it's a case of identifying email addresses, um, then it will basically need to over or exceed the threshold specified before the policy action is applied. What I'm doing is I'm also controlling uh, transfers to controlled storage device types. So that's obviously things like um, flash drives, external hard drives, internal hard drives, and things like that. I'm also um, monitoring the clipboard so that you can't, say, highlight and copy and paste things that are necessarily sensitive. I'm also disabling the ability to take a screenshot. Um, and then I can also do things like scanning network shares, controlling thin client drives if you're using thin clients in your environments or controlling transfers to uh, locally attached or, or, or some network printers. Um, then I'm also controlling it to a couple of applications, predominantly a few common web browsers, uh, some email clients, uh, no IM chat or clients because I don't have any installed. Uh, same for file sharing, but that could also do be things like Google Drive or Dropbox or uh, any other type of cloud synchronization tool. Um, and then obviously some social media or just blanket other uh, applications. And in this case, I've selected FileZilla as an FTP client. Um, next, I'm not controlling uh, particularly file types here. More importantly, I want to focus on the predefined content filter blacklist. So these are entries that are available on all endpoint protector instances. And as you can see, you can control transfers of uh, or control the flow of information that contains credit card information and any type of personal information or personally identifiable information, such as dates and driving license numbers and ID numbers and passport numbers. Um, and obviously, depending on your country, you can select it here. In the event that your country is not listed here, that doesn't pose too much of a problem. This is just the predefined content filter that's available. Uh, you can always come to the regular expression section and then one can actually go to this section over here and you can write your own regular expression. So I basically just added a couple for illustrative purposes. So if I quickly digress and go over to this section over here, um, in the case of trying to identify particularly laser brand credit cards, that is my regular expression to match the different types of credit card numbers that follow the laser format. 
Um, so obviously, it's just a case of creating the regular expression in question in order to flag that information. And one of the other common examples here is, uh, let's say, for example, you, uh, let's say it's a different type of organization. As long as the information follows a predefined format, like uh, insurance policy numbers or uh, account numbers or formats, you can basically uh, try and match that information and obviously control the flow of that. So it's really customizable uh, regardless of what industry um, your organization is intended for. Um, then, of course, you can do things like identifying uh, custom dictionary words, and whitelisting things like uh, file locations or network shares or specific email domains. Um, and it effectively just means that you can really customize uh, on a very granular level the control and flow of sensitive information outside of your organization. Next is the enforced easy lock encryption. Um, and effectively what this, as I mentioned, does uh, is it enforces encryption on uh, USB devices. I don't have a license in place here, um, which is why it's obviously showing these warnings. Um, and effectively, you'd be able to see all of the clients that are enrolled. So there you can see that is a colleague of mine uh, that actually has a Transcend flash drive um, that uh, was flagged and identified in the system. And I'd be able to enforce encryption on that device wherever it, it is connected, because we basically identify things like the serial number uh, in addition to another, a number of other bits of unique information to this device. So we can be really granular in our control of devices. Um, next, before I cover mobile device management, there's a few other things that I want to cover in terms of things like the device control and the content aware protection. There's the offline temporary password. So this is especially useful because obviously it would reduce the security of your organization to change a policy um, just to allow one user that maybe needs to actually copy a particular file for, for whatever reason uh, legitimately. Um, and then in doing so, obviously decrease the security for the rest of your organization. So you can either on a, on a device level um, or on a computer level or specifically for content aware protection policies, generate an offline temporary password that can then be valid for anything from 30 minutes up to 30 days. And that'll allow the user to actually bypass the protection uh, for as long as that code is valid. It's important to note that it is an offline temporary password. So this is also great if the user is operating remotely um, because it means that they can actually go into the endpoint protector agent. They just right click on it. Um, and then there's an option that you can actually enter an offline temporary password, even if you don't have connectivity to your endpoint protector server at this point in time. Um, next, in terms of reports and analysis, obviously, the whole point of a DLP solution is to get absolute visibility over your organization and the flow of information. So we can see that there's policies that have been received by some of my endpoints and then all the active directory synchronization tasks that have occurred uh, every 15 minutes or so in order to ensure that we're up to date with the users and machines that may form part of my environment. Um, and then there's things like the content aware report, which is what I want to show primarily, uh, where you can see I've basically flagged things like uh, SSN numbers and dates and email addresses. And if I go back to when I first deployed this instance quite some time ago, you can see things like I did a couple of tests here um, in terms of some of the policies that I had in place. Uh, I basically identified a bunch of the default images on a Windows 7 machine. Um, I then created a Word document and started controlling the flow of that because I was trying to upload it through Chrome as a web browser to a file sharing portal. I then modified that document and I added credit card information. And as you can see, it flags the last four digits of the credit card number and actually identifies the credit card in type as well. Um, and then in the case of these documents over here, again, I try to upload it through Chrome as a web browser. Um, and then I've actually got file shadows over here. So these are copies of these documents that were made uh, that I can now download and review for say auditory purposes or whatever the case may be. Another important thing is obviously in an IT organization, especially in terms of data loss prevention, your administrators obviously have a, a substantial amount of rights. So it's important to have a audit trail of what your administrators actually did. 
so you can come to admin admin actions over here and you can see whether or not people are logging in or out uh, whether or not things were deleted or changed so you can always get absolute visibility over which user actually uh, performed what action and when uh, so there's highly detailed logging information available you can also customize and create a range of alerts whether it's system alerts to do things like monitoring around um, license expiration or disk space or whatever the case may be um, there's also the content aware alerts and uh, MDM alerts and even easy lock device uh, or USB device encryption alerts so the main purpose of that is obviously you don't want an administrator to constantly sit uh, sifting through the information on your endpoint protector instance once you're satisfied with the information that you are getting into the dashboard uh, and into the reporting and analysis section it would obviously be to your benefit to come and configure the alerts then um, so that you only actually come to your environment and to your dashboard in order to investigate some type of uh, breach or some type of alert that was triggered because that flow of information wasn't uh, supposed to happen so then you can maybe go to the person and try and inquire uh, why they tried to transfer that information maybe it was legitimate you can then obviously off issue the offline temporary password or um, maybe there's a, a policy change required for the entire organization An important thing to note with endpoint protector is it also uh, it is uh, supporting active directory in my case but uh, that is not a requirement you can also run it in a workgroup environment as well um, in terms of appliance information that's just basic things such as uh, showing uh, disk usage um, in this case obviously I've got a very small disk assigned so it's important to monitor the amount of storage that you're using wherever you may be storing your file shadows because that would obviously be a fair amount of uh, space depending on the number of file shadows that are being made um, and you can also uh, in a other section you can actually change the directory or even mount a network or FTP location for the file shadows and the logs so that it's not actually stored on the endpoint protector server itself um, then in terms of server management these are obviously basic just files uh, time synchronization options and then uh, network configuration options and this is also how I would be able to reboot or shut down the server an important thing to note though is uh, even though the SSH server on my instance is enabled unfortunately you do not get root access uh, for endpoint protector that is only for the use of Cososis, the software vendor of endpoint protector in the event that uh, we need to provide some type of support uh, for your instance and need to log into it you can also integrate with a seam solution so that's obviously to aggregate all of your logs into um, some other type of system in terms of maintenance there's obviously a number of maintenance options so that you can clean up logs uh, that are old or take backups uh, or mount the external storage that I mentioned for things like your shadows um, and more importantly in terms of system configuration uh, you can obviously go into things like client software and I can obviously select what operating system I uh, need the endpoint agent for and I can actually download that accordingly um, you can also push upgrades for your software straight from the system um, so in the event that there are updates available for any of your endpoints you can actually push that straight from your dashboard um, more importantly what I want to show here is actually the system settings so these are a summary of all of the settings that would be applied when you first deploy endpoint protector and this is where I mentioned earlier in terms of the endpoint rights what you want to prioritize uh, either only using computer or only using uh, sorry only using computer or only using user or using both and then prioritizing the one or the other but then those will still override your group rights and your global rights then there's a couple of other settings that you can configure for say outbound emails to occur and a couple of other things in terms of system licensing um, obviously you can see that I've just got a small license pool available I've only got five endpoint licenses and five mobile device management licenses uh, and I can actually import licenses over here or list them uh, and in terms of listing them what I can do is I can obviously release a license maybe for an uh, endpoint that will no longer be used and I want to recycle that license and apply it to a new endpoint then in terms of system parameters this is just an overview of the 
capabilities across operating systems. So this is a nice summary so that you can see uh, what you can actually control in terms of devices on Windows, Mac OS X, and the various Linux distributions that are supported. Obviously, Windows is by far the most supported platform um, for obvious reasons, but um, Endpoint Protector is actually one of the very, very few DLP solutions that is actually cross-platform as well. Uh, and then in terms of content-aware protection, you basically have a lot of the same, and obviously these are applicable to controlling the flow of information to things like uh, USB devices and to card readers and to printers and to any other type of external storage medium. So um, I hope that that was an informative session. Um, obviously, please refer to our wiki for uh, documentation and other videos. Um, and obviously, you can always get a hold of us um, through our support or through our other partner channels in the wiki um, in order to obtain more information or to get pricing information um, or obviously to obtain a trial um, so that you can actually test this in your environment as well. And the trials are effectively valid for 30 days um, and they basically run for, if I remember correctly, about uh, 50 endpoints at a time. Thank you very much.